uh, tuning in with Tom. I have a, a very special guest, someone I've, I've known for a while now. I think it's, you know, seven or eight years ago, you came to a little town called Medina, New York, yeah. and played a special show for us at a venue called 810 Meadworks. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. But uh, before we get into that, uh, Elliot Lewis, and best known probably as a member of the Hall & Oates Band, uh, frequent face on live from Daryl's house. I believe the only one other than Daryl that's been on every single episode, former member of average white band. But before we get into all that stuff, a solo artist as well. And from, from what I'm seeing on social media, you got some new music coming out. So let's, the starting point will be what can fans expect from your, your so, new solo stuff. And maybe we'll talk a little about the previous solo work as well. Well, great to be with you, Tom, as always. Um, yeah, you know, this time of year for me is usually, you know, it's a, it's about transitioning from the touring year to the winter time and hunkering down and making a lot of music. You know, I've done it in the past where I've actually written and recorded on the road, <laughs> but that's a, that's really difficult. So, so yeah, I have new music coming out. I'm uh, pretty far along into a new EP. It'll be at least a five or six song EP. Um, all new material uh, and then I'm going to go back and because a lot of my material I had to take off the market. Uh, long story short, about three CDs ago, about five years ago, I did a, I did a release with a, a pretty major label and we took some songs that existed on some of my other EPs and independent releases and because they were living on two different variations because of licensing stuff i had to take some of those off the market so this year i'll be releasing a brand new ep new new material and then putting out sort of a, a almost a best of a sort of overview of my whole career a lot of my earlier music and releasing it in new form so uh and a couple of new videos so yeah, yeah it's been a, keeping really it's, busy it's interesting because you know it's funny i was just looking at um amazon music you know one of the streaming services last night just pulling mm -hmm. up some stuff and was going to, I always love to listen to the artists that I'm going to be talking with the night before. And I noticed that there was kind of a, a gaping hole in the, mm. in your catalog as far as the streaming services. So evidently yeah. that's going to be addressed. So that's, that's good. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, otherwise I'd have about between full length CDs and EPs, I'd probably have about nine releases out there. But like I said, I had to take some of them off, but I'm going to address that now and uh, I'll be happy to get that stuff back out there. And, you know, most people know you as the keyboardist uh, in Hall & Oates, but I mean, the reality yeah. is that your solo work is it's guitar driven. I mean, I, I, yeah. I, I mean, I don't know. I've, I always enjoyed it. Uh, in some ways it has the sensibility of like an ACDC as far as the rhythm to it. Um, I know you're a Kiss fan too. So, I mean, there's so many influences that sort of meld together yeah. <laughs> are, are are people surprised that it's that it's not as hall and oats influenced as as maybe they would expect from uh maybe yeah because of the association i think it's a logical you know um assumption that that i would be more closely aligned but I, you know actually some of my stuff is i mean i put out one of my solo releases you know sometimes you can't help this and i think a lot of songwriters out there if they're listening to this will understand sometimes you get very influenced by your surroundings so when i was still with the average white band i think what my first solo release was very influenced by that home for me musically the average white band so there was more funk there's always going to be a little bit of my original influences, which is the rock stuff. But I love soul as well. I love soul and funk. And when I uh, joined Hall & Oates, I put out a, a solo uh, CD, and that was definitely influenced by being with them. But at that point, I kind of took a step back and said, who is Elliot Lewis? I really have to kind of like focus in on what it is that I really love and not be affected by my surroundings. But there really is a lot of different influences. Like you said, there's the rock stuff, there's the stall stuff. And even when I approach my more edgier rock stuff, I think there's just naturally some soulful stuff in there. I just can't help but get away from that. You know, the Todd Rundgren influences and all the stuff that I grew up with. So yeah, it's all there. <laughs> Yeah, and you're. I knew you were. You grew up in was it Connecticut? It's a, or that yeah. area. Okay, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's interesting because you. I mean, two of the major influences you have are sort of that Philly soul. That's uh, Daryl Hall, who you've been working with for years, and of course Todd was a very yeah. much a Philly soul guy too. So uh, yeah, 
Exactly. It's interesting so how those part of it. come together. Yeah. <laughs> it's all a part of it. I, I, you know, at this point, I just embrace it. And these new songs I'm writing, I'm really not, uh, I'm not uh, directing what they are. They're just coming out and they feel really, really good. So I'm kind of letting them be what they want. Uh, there was just a rock, a very rock edgy song I released a couple of weeks ago. And this new song I'm about to release called Legacy is completely different. I think it'll, it'll kind of uh, shock a little bit of my, my followers a little bit. But it's, you know, just letting them be what they want to be. Are you, are you a lyric first guy or are you a, a music first guy? I'm, now I would say, if anything, I'm more of a lyric guy um, and melody. I think if I could come up with a concept for a lyric, um, you know, a phrase, a title, that usually is the nucleus for a song. And that makes it, for me, a more strong I mean, it can work anyway. I can come up with a guitar riff, but usually it's a concept. It's an idea, a phrase, a lyric, a title that gets the song going. And, and who's your who's your trusted, you know, like I, I write columns and stuff. I always got to give over to my wife because she's my yeah. my harshest critic and my best friend. Yeah. Um, who are the people that you trust to, to kind of listen to stuff and say, Elliot, this is great, or Elliot, this ain't so great? Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, my brother is one of my best sounding boards and my best critics. He'll be honest with me and, uh, you know, I've known him all of my life and he's a massive, massive music listener. He consumes so much music. So I really trust his opinion. My girlfriend is incredibly musical. Um, so I bounce some stuff off of her and some friends and even Daryl, actually. I send Daryl, um, I saw, sent him my last video uh, of a song called Well Traveled Heart and he loved it. And because I'm always interested in his perspective and feedback. So, yeah, there's a few people that I, I get some uh, opinions from and I welcome that. You know, I think earlier on when I was a kid in my 20s and I was writing, I was like, I didn't need opinions. You know, when you're you, you're yes. a bit more cocky and you're a bit more uh, reassured. But now I really welcome that because, you know, we all have something to learn. And I want an uh, honest opinion because it makes me grow and keep learning about new uh, new new ways to do it. Yeah, no, I, I agree. It's very tough. And I, you know, I've even yeah. found in my personal experience is some of the stuff that I didn't think was my greatest work is the, the stuff that really resonates and the stuff that I really put my heart into. Some people just go, yeah, that's okay. You know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. It's good to get away from it. You know, we get yeah. so close to it when we're working on something. It's good to take a step, step back and get some opinions and get some, you know, so I, I, you know, I was thinking about this as we're getting ready to talk, and you have a very unique uh, skill set that was actually uh, great for this pandemic. And I, most people don't say great pandemic in the same yeah. sentence. But if you think about it, you know, uh, I mentioned earlier, you first time I saw you perform was in front of, it was like a very small, intimate meet and greet about 40 some odd people. And I've always made this statement that you learn more about an artist in front of 40 people then you do 4,000 because anybody can play in front of 4,000 and feed off the energy, mm -hmm, but you got to mm -hmm. be able to bring it in front of 45 and still have that, that same energy. Now, not only that, but because of live from Daryl's house, you had performed a lot without any audience at all. So once this pandemic came, do yeah. you think that you were much better suited for this whole environment where you could still interact with fans, but not necessarily have to have them in the same room? I think I definitely was. I think I was really conditioned to do that very thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Having spent nine years doing Daryl's show, you know, I mean, there's people in the room, but there's no audience um, and there's cameras all around us that the, you know, the, the, the watcher wouldn't necessarily see, but there's cameras, you know, all around us. So I'm, I've been used to that environment of playing kind of on my own or with a small group of people and no audience. So I think it made it very comfortable for me when, um, the lockdown happened and we, a lot of us started doing live streams and stuff like that. You know, I was totally comfortable doing that. It was like, oh yeah, I'm going to kind of do another variation of what I've been doing for nine years on the show. So, and I really try to encourage other musicians that were sort of struggling with it. You know, it was like, oh man, what are we going to do here? I can't wait till gigs come back. And I would try to encourage them, you know, if you can, get the camera on, you know, get the computer on, get the Facebook live and, and, you know, or at least practice it. You don't have to go live, just practice it, get comfortable with 
being on your own, talking to a camera and just feeling comfortable. You know, it can be done. Not everybody got on board with it, but uh, I, there was a lot of people doing great stuff through that that year. Yeah, there definitely was. But as I said, I, you know, it was so interesting to think about the fact that you you had been there. So it was such a yeah. natural transition because I remember watching a lot of your live streams and going, man, he looks so comfortable in this environment. And uh, mm. but then I thought to myself, well, sure, he's he's kind of been in this environment before. So that's yeah. that's really neat. Yeah. Without the pandemic, of course. But <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, I mean, man. Obviously, given the choice, you know, you'd rather be in a, in a live setting. I would imagine that that first Tall and Oates show back in front of a real, you know, huge audience must have been mm -hmm. a pretty emotional experience for all of you. It was. Yeah. You mean yeah, coming back after the, the right. year and a half? Yeah, that was definitely like, wow, we're here. And it was so uh, it was surreal you know because we had been all of a sudden for a year and a half kind of trained ourselves not to be around a lot of people and here we are on a stage with you know twelve thousand, and mostly unmasked people so it was a bit weird it was a bit surreal it was we were concerned but we were trying to do they were certainly trying to do everything as safely as possible they did you know they followed followed every protocol like i was saying everybody was tested every single day so that became a normal thing for us you know uh and we got through it you know it was different but we got through it um and hopefully things get you know back on track and we can get back out there and do it do it some more you know i was able to do a lot of my own shows like you said a lot of my own yeah. shows are much much smaller intimate shows it could be 40 50 people up to 100 150 people so it's a little easier to to navigate through some of those because you don't have twelve thousand people sitting shoulder to shoulder in a venue so it was a little easier to navigate through that but uh yeah we got to hope for the best for this coming year and, and you know, as far as your your solo career, you mm -hmm. you really seem to resonate with with crowds in Ohio. You know, which is which is fascinating. I know we've we've uh, yeah mentioned mentioned Todd before, but I know that you always seem to do really well in Ohio. What's what's the story behind that? When did you start to kind of work those yeah. crowds? Well, long story short, back I don't know what year it was. It's got to be about ten years ago now. Um, when I was on the road with Hall and Oates, a guy kind of track me down i was i do a lot of photography as you know on the road with them and i think i was outside the uh, chicago theater and this guy tracked me down and he approached me and he said hey i've been following you and seeing what you've been doing in your solo career and he said i think i might be able to book you in ohio i live in ohio so you know how a lot of people just talk and it just that's all it amounts to well yeah. he was really persistent and he uh he messaged me back found me on facebook and said i think i have a few venues for you lined up and i you know i had to check them out and make sure they were for real and stuff and uh, eventually i did and gave it a go and went out and did like three shows again this has got to be about nine years ago now and uh, they went really well. They were small shows, but I was w well received and asked back. So I went back like six months later and did like six shows. And then another six months went by and I went back and did 10 shows and it just kept building. And then I would branch out to, you know, Indiana, Michigan, get into Chicago as well. But there was definitely an Ohio base to start with. And um, so I've been going out there almost pretty much every year since then if not once, twice a year. And I love it. It's a long drive, but you know, there's some great people out there and I try to make the rounds as much as I can. I'm, I'm trying to branch out this year if I can and get to Kentucky and move it out a little bit as much as possible. We well, definitely got to find your way back to Buffalo. So uh, I know yeah. we've, we've, we've tried to make that happen a few times, but it wasn't I know. always, wasn't well, always we, successful. We will. Let's we try to make, make, it it, make it happen this year. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to, uh, you know, as I mentioned before we started uh, off camera, I guess, but before, you know, the stuff that's going to be everybody's yeah. watching that I got some records that I want to throw at you and uh, get some reactions and maybe have a little discussion about them. This okay. first one, I don't know if you're going to know why I'm showing it to you, but I'm hoping that you do. Are you familiar with this record? Well, well, I, I, I'm not so much familiar with the songs on it, but certainly familiar with Paul Carrick. Yeah. So the producer of this record mm -hmm. is your buddy T-Bone. Ah, well, I was going to say there's there's one of the connections. Now, my brother, who I was mentioning, who is a soundboard for me for a lot of my writing, is a huge Paul Carrick fan. He's always been like, man, you've got to meet him and try to write some songs with him one day. And so when I first joined Hall & Oates, 
one of the first things I did with them because they had released a, a, a cover record called Our Kind of Soul. So yes. because I play guitar and sing, they took me along with T-Bone and it was me, T-Bone and Daryl and John. We went on a whole promotional tour and we were over in England doing some shows, the four of us. Paul Carrick was there and T-Bone being friends with him and having worked with him introduced us and we had a chat. And uh, But that's as far as it went. But I'm a huge fan. He's an amazing songwriter. Yeah, and I know you and T-Bone were, were very close. And I, I'm a huge fan of, of Paul as well. I mean, mm -hmm. T-Bone's influences are just all over this record. And uh, I, I mean, have to I, check I, that record out. I, I do. I really have to check that one out. Yeah, I think you I think it would. I think it would obviously knowing T-Bone, I think it's something that would probably bring a smile to your face. And I mean, this, yeah. the songs on here are just absolutely fantastic. All right. We got another nice. one here for you. Again, I think one of your early influences. How about these guys? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. So I discovered them. You know, I've been reading like we were back when we were kids. We were reading the circus magazine, creams and all that stuff. So I would see them advertise for sure. But it was really a girlfriend that turned me on to them. I think that brought over to my house. I think it was uh, Heaven Tonight. So the record that came out, just the studio record that came out just before that. I was like, wow, this is like heavy Beatles. It's like power pop Beatles, you know, just so hooky and so much fun and their image just grab me and really what happened is then of course you go back once you find something you like you go back right right because this hadn't come out yet um and got in color in their first record and i would I notice the theme here i would turn the record over look at the, the songwriting credits and be like well rick nielsen wrote 95 percent of these songs and i thought i was transitioning to being a guitar player from being a drummer because i started as a drummer and i was thinking wow I need to be a songwriter. If this goofy looking guy can do it, maybe I've got a shot. <laughs> <laughs> so it was really Rick Nielsen that inspired me to, to really be a songwriter. I mean, I was heading in that direction, but I was like, that kind of put me over the edge. Uh, but then of course, once I was hooked on the band, this record came out and I was completely all in. And uh, I listened to uh, Ad Budokan every day. I would, you know, with headphones, I would li literally just like a sponge, just absorb every single note, and everything that they were doing. It was so exciting, you know, and they put yeah. they put the Budokan on the map and I think vice versa, <laughs> you know, uh, it was exciting. And, and the story behind that, you know, I'm sure you know that they, yep. you know, they that was originally intended on being just, I guess, a Japanese release. And because the imports took off and were so, so popular and so demand, they held out the release of their next studio record, Dream Police, and um, and then eventually made that a, a bona fide release here. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, it's it's uh, you're right. I mean, Rick Nielsen, of course, it gets a lot of gets a lot of credit. I mean, Xander's yeah. the the face of the band and everything. But now that you mentioned, I mean, I could definitely hear some influence in your guitar playing through Rick. I mean, he's got that he's got that yeah. really good uh, rhythmic sensibility, but he can just pop into a lead on, on any moment's notice. It's kind of crazy. Exactly. Exactly. He's just, a, he's an amazing showman. This is the way he puts everything together. He's not like an incredible, he's not like Jeff Beck as a soloist. He's very competent, but his songwriting and his image, the whole thing just works so, so beautifully. I think it was just a brilliant way to put a band together with the two, the two different images, you know? Yeah. Yeah. The crazy guys or the, you know, the, the goofy yeah. looking guys on the back and then the good yeah. looking guys on the front. So yeah. did you, you, you played the Budokan at some point then with Hall & Oates, haven't yeah, you? Yeah, I've played the Budokan at least twice that I can remember, wow. maybe three times, like Madison Square Garden. It was Budokan was probably twice, and the Garden, has, I think, has been three times now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. that must have been that must have been a dream come true. And you've, and yeah. at least, I know at least Robin was on live from Daryl's house, correct? Was Yeah, Cheap Trick were, yeah. Yeah. Robin, Rick. Was Rick yeah, exactly. The three of them, Tom Peterson, Robin and Rick. Yep. And, it, you know, that was obviously one of the highlights for me on the show because I, I was such a fan, such a longtime fan, you know, and every time leading up to that, you know, when Daryl would sometimes ask the band, like, you know, who do you, you guys, who do you think should be on the show? And I would always be like, cheap trick. It was like a broken <laughs> record, you know, because I knew Daryl knew that knew them. He had been friends with them for years and I'm, I'm a huge fan, but it took a while for the schedules to uh, to come together for them to be on the show. But when they came on the show that day, 
you know, I'm, I'm the keyboard player generally on most of the shows. So, you know, Tom Peterson looked at me and go, and he was like, oh, keyboards, huh? You know, because <laughs> keyboards are <laughs> a little bit frowned upon. And I was like, it's okay, I'm really a guitar player. <laughs> but once I got talking to Rick, um, we talked about his guitar collection and we talked about dates and he was he was kind of blown away that I knew so much about their history that I was such a fan. And by the end of the day, when we got to the dinner segment, it almost became a joke. Robin said, hey, Al, when did we do that again? What year was that? Because they had forgotten. And I would yeah. be like, it was no, it was 1979 you had that guitar because you played on a midnight special. And, you know, like I knew all these details. So it was pretty fun. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, no, I, I grew up just absolutely loving uh, Cheap Trick and that album. First one I, I got was Dream Police. And I saw him on that tour and yeah. I've been hooked ever since. I've seen him a, a ton of times. All yeah. right, well, let's keep going with the records. This one, I know we're going to have some talking about because you probably had to learn a bunch of songs on this one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes, I did. <laughs> you know, that's a record that kind of passed by me. So, you know, I was a, a huge Todd, Todd fan growing up. You know, Something Anything was playing nonstop. All the early Todd records, um, Wizard of Two Star. And then, you know, we grow up and and Todd was still a part of that, but I wasn't following him. I was an active fan after that period. I went on to other things. I was really into Bowie and all the rock stuff. So by the time this record came out, I really wasn't that aware of it. Um, and so, you know, I've obviously worked with him now over the years, a bunch of times when he reached out for me to do this virtual tour with him that you were at. Um, yep. He was going to do this pretty much in its entirety. So I had to listen to it and learn it, obviously. And I was like, wow, I was, I was so impressed with this record and the way he put it together. I mean, there's some incredible, incredible musicians on that record. Uh, and it, honestly, it was very challenging for me. I don't consider myself a, uh, <laughs> a great keyboard player. I really don't. People view me as a keyboard player, but was not my first instrument, not something I intended on making a whole career out of. So learning this stuff was definitely a challenge, but I love a challenge. I love to be able to be pushed and, and grow and, you know, learn new things. So this incredible record. Feel It was really, I think, one of my favorite moments. Yeah, it's a, well, Feel It, I believe that was written by Vince Welnick, who uh, I, was, yeah. I had the chance to meet before he passed away. Vince was, mm -hmm. Vince was just a very sweet guy, kind of a troubled soul and, mm -hmm. you know, tragic ending and everything. And when I'd play with the Grateful Dead, but, mm -hmm. you know, I saw both bands. I mean, I saw the first tour with the original band. And I saw you guys in Chicago and virtually. Yeah. And I uh, was so impressed at just the, just mm -hmm. the camaraderie on stage. I, I feel like you know, sometimes I feel like as bands get bigger, you have more of a recipe for disaster. But man, you guys yeah. really came together as a unit. So that must have been a great experience. It was so, so it was so great. I was so honored and humbled that he reached out to me. I mean, you know, God, Todd has got his choice of the world's best musicians. And I'm like, wow, why are you asking me? I mean, I just, like I said, I don't view myself as that caliber. I mean, uh, Gil, the other keyboard player, is an amazingly accomplished keyboard player. Uh, all of those guys are just great you know, uh, Prairie and Chasm, just all amazing musicians. So it was fun. I've worked, worked with Chasm a little bit previously. So it was yeah. great to be with him again. And um, yeah, it was a blast. Yeah, I, I uh, well, I've always heard that they say too, that, you know, as you get older, it's more important how you get on on the bus, which in your yeah. case, you weren't, you weren't necessarily in a bus, but you were certainly living the whole yeah. group of people were living together for about 30 days. So obviously more than that, really two months from, from yeah. start to finish, it was quite a while and uh, under some, you know, kind of, uh, uh, you know, not the best situation. It was winter time in Chicago and there was yeah. a pandemic. So it was, you know, but you know, we're playing with Todd and we're able to, it was, it was the coolest thing. Cause we, we felt like we were on tour, but without the travel. We were doing shows almost every day, but we didn't have to get on a tour bus after the show and drive 12 hours, you know, <laughs> wake up yeah. in another city. So that was really cool. And, you know, leave it to Todd to do something that was so, you know, state of the art and, uh, and creative and inventive. I think, you know, one of my heroes for sure. Yeah, I mean, that show that I got to see in person was uh, surreal. I mean, it was yeah. just a surreal experience. So, 
And yeah. I got to share my bagels with you guys. So uh, yeah. <laughs> it's, my, it's my first mention of bagels, but you got to mention them at some point. Oh, boy. All I right. know that How record about, well. I, I know, you know, and, and uh, I had a chance to to meet Peter Frampton, uh, gosh, you know, seven or eight years ago. And yeah. what what a sweet guy. And I know that obviously it's not just the record, but you have a history with, with Peter. He was one of the first guys that you met, correct? Yeah. And, and all because of my friend, you know, the, my best friend that I grew up with met in elementary school and I started drums. He had just started bass and Jack Bruce from cream gave him his first bass and his wow. father was, yeah, his, <laughs> I know exactly. Wow. His father oh. was in the music business, working with mountain, working with West Bruce and Lang, um, and then working with Peter Frampton, you know, he was his promotion man for this record. So, you know, we were exposed to so much stuff. Super Tramp, The Who, Peter, you know, Peter came over to their house in Norwalk, Connecticut, and Kevin and I, his son and my, myself, went over there and would jam and hang out with Peter. And it was just surreal at 14 years old, you know. Uh, and they'd go see him at Madison Square Garden and meet him backstage and all of that stuff. So this record was, it was such a part of my life and soundtrack at that point in my life, 76 to 77. Uh, I was immersed in it. <laughs> but he's, he's a great guy and an incredible guitar player. I mean, he's yeah. really amazingly musical, has such an incredible career. Yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, and so this record, I don't, I, it just, it has aged so well. I mean, especially yeah. in an era where everything is so pre-programmed and whatnot, and there's always been debates as far as the level of overdubs, but if you've ever seen him live, th there's, this is how it is, man. This That's, is Peter Frampton yeah. live. That is live. As we now, all know now, Kiss Alive was very much edited and overdubbed, but this, I believe, was a straight, beautifully captured live experience. And, you know, Bob Mayo is keyboard at uh, keyboard player at this time. You know, there's a lot of correlation there between Bob actually was in Hall and Oates. I sort of replaced him in a way, but oh, even wow. before, but be, before that, when I was still in the average white band, Bob Mayo actually subbed to be the guitar player because the original guitar player in average white band, I think, had some health issues with his family and had to take like a few weeks off. So Bob Mayo actually stepped in as the guitar player in average white band for three weeks. And uh, so we were on the road together and he was he was just him and T-Bone were just uh, master musicians. Just wow. incredible. Yep. And I, I Bob has since passed away, if I remember correctly. Right. Yeah. Bob, and I know T-Bone has as well. So yep. it's a shame. Yep. All right. Well, this last one, uh, I, I it's it only came out a few weeks ago on vinyl. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's been kicking around, I believe, on uh, CD and digital download for a while. I, I've spun it a couple of times already. I got it as a Christmas present and totally fell in love with it. How about this one? Uh, yeah, <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> that was a cool moment for them, you know, to go back and uh, play that show. And I think they had said that was really where they did their first sort of professional show when they were starting out in whatever it was, 72, something like that, you know. And they had, they really wanted to go back there and uh, capture a show. Uh, so that was fun, you know, to be in a, a small legendary room like that and do a show with them. Do you, I mean, when these things come out on record, I mean, I don't know if you're a record collector. I am. Yeah. That's why I'm throwing up the vinyl records. Do you get copies of this kind of stuff? I remember once I uh, shared a record with somebody and, and they were going to sign. It was actually Gil Esaias. I showed yeah. him a Utopia vinyl and he says, I'm not on that one. I'm like, well, sure you are. You're right here, Gil. This is the, yeah. the newer Utopia version. He's like, I didn't even know this thing came out. So I always yeah. wondered if, if stuff ever comes out that you have no idea had, had hit the streets. Well, you know, when stuff like when that came out, um, they hadn't done any vinyl release on it. They gave me the CD copy, of course, you know, and the DVD that was captured of it. Um, I was a vinyl junkie when I was a kid, but I haven't have I haven't had vinyl now in a long time. I'm ready to I'm getting ready to move again. And one of the first things I want to buy for myself when we get settled uh, into this new move is a is a record player and get get some vinyl collection going again. I miss yep. it. Yeah, there's some Absolutely. great news. I just picked up the uh, Hall and Oates uh, Private Eyes. It was clear vinyl, so that's fantastic. And hopefully, I mean, I think the opportunity, if it presents itself, we'd love to see mm -hmm. some Elliot, Elliot Lewis solo record on vinyl. I mean, I I'll... think that's in the that's in the works. That's in the works for sure. Now, have you checked out this new uh, mix called? Is it Atmos? 
have you checked out that new those new it's like a it's like a, a new almost a surround way of mixing and there's a lot of vinyl coming out with this new um this new approach to mixing or this whatever it's called atmos i just no, wonder I if you had any experience with it yeah i think no. one of the new kiss uh box set um versions of destroyer has have this uh this new mix on it so i'll have to check it out yeah it sounds good i mean i'll definitely have to check it out too I've, i'm not a yeah. huge audiophile pretty decent setup in my room here and uh yeah. you know way too many todd rungren posters as my granddaughter says todd rungren is everywhere in here, <laughs> Papa. but uh, um so uh let's wrap it up with maybe a, a couple of questions and I, as always this has just been a lot of fun i i can't wait to hear the new music and everything like that and certainly i'll make Likewise. sure to help promote it and stuff like that but uh you know, I was thinking about this because I know you're a Kiss fan, and our, our our mutual friend Gus there is a Kiss fan as well. And we'll yeah, happy, yeah, you're talking about that. And uh, Paul Stanley, Gene Simmons, how, live from Daryl's house, ever a possibility? <laughs> I mean, I oh my be, god, could you uh, imagine? <laughs> uh, I'm not sure that would ever happen. I'm not sure that will ever happen. I won't get my hopes up on that. A because we're not really shooting new episodes right now. The new episodes sort of stopped a while back. And, you know, it's ultimately up to Daryl, and, and that's not necessarily Daryl's cup of tea. He's a soul. He's a Philly soul. He likes rock, for sure. I mean, he loved the Cheap Trick episode, but I'm not sure he would go that far into that world. Although I think it would make for unbelievable TV and entertainment, you know, having those two worlds come together. <laughs> I, I mean, I don't know if they'd show up with or without makeup, but I agree. It was, you know, it was funny. I think one of the, one of the, my favorite moments ever in the history of uh, life from Daryl's house is uh, the Tommy Shaw episode. Yeah. Because I mean, I, I grew up as a sticks fan, you know, Tommy is the one member of sticks who has eluded me that I've tried to interview like my entire uh, adult life. Yeah. So if, if you have any connections, but uh, anyhow, where Daryl looks at me and he goes like, hey, what's it like to work with Ted Nugent? <laughs> He's like, I can't picture you, Tommy Shaw, working with Ted Nugent. And I think I it's, it's almost like the same juxtaposition where you have like Gene Simmons and Daryl Hall uh, sitting down having dinner together. You know, what kind of conversation would they have? It'd be interesting. Exactly. They? I know. <laughs> I think Daryl and Gene have met before. I think they're, he told me a brief story about that meeting before. So they kind of know each other a little bit in passing, you know. Uh, but yeah, that would be interesting. Tommy Shaw, I thought was amazing. I mean, he came in and nailed it. I've always had a lot of respect for him. And my old friend that, uh, that I was mentioning who worked for Peter Frampton also worked with Tommy Shaw, one of his bands. Uh, was it Mr. Big or something like that? I think it was uh, a damn, damn Yankees. Probably. Damn Yankees. That's it. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. That's it. Um, yeah. but yeah, yeah, he was came in and nailed it. His voice was incredible. It was so on point, you know, just had all of his range and, uh, yeah, it was great. Great show. Yeah. Well, good stuff. Well, Elliot, uh, wishing you the happiest <laughs> of new year's. We'll hopefully get this up early next year, if not before the new year's, but, um, anything else you'd like to tell people about that's, that's in the works and the plans for next year that, uh, you know, you want your fans to know? Um, no, but hit, if you can find me on social media, Facebook, let me know where you would like me to play because I, I feel like I'll be doing a lot more solo shows next year than I normally get a chance to do. So I'm very excited about that. So uh, once in a while, I'll reach out and ask fans to let me know where you want me to come, you know, where in your area or in your city or town is an appropriate music venue for me to play. So uh, find me and hit me up and let me know because I'm making notes of all of it. I'm trying to plan out next year and get to a lot more places on my own than I normally do. Well, good. Well, I said, hopefully that uh, the Western yeah. New York area, Buffalo, uh, Rochester. I mean, there's lots of great clubs out here, lots of great venues. And uh, if yeah. not, I'm, I'm just going to have to break down and, take one of these trips to Ohio. It's not that bad to drive. So. <laughs> Please do. Well, I'll get, I'll get to, I'll get to Buffalo area for sure. All right, man. Well, I appreciate it. Well, again, everybody don't forget, follow Elliot Lewis on social media. Make sure you buy his new record when it comes out. And uh, again, Elliot, thank you so much for everything. I appreciate it. Thank you, Tom. Have a great new year and I'll talk to you soon. All right, man.